Welcome to Fearless, Do More, the podcast where we dive into the minds of some extraordinary and fearless businesses and people, people who are challenging the status quo and who are helping to change the world of business around us. I'm your host, Jill Hunter. I'm the managing partner at Square One Law. On each episode, I'll be chatting to innovators, change makers, and trailblazers, where we explore the unique journeys of our guests. We'll delve into the fears they face, the setbacks they've overcome, the lessons they've learned along the way. We'll uncover the secrets behind their resilience and we'll find out what motivates them to keep going, even in the face of adversity. We'll also have a few laughs along the way too. My guests are all leaders who relentlessly pursue their passions, not only to create a better tomorrow, but who inspire us to push our own boundaries, those who fear less and do more. Welcome to this episode of our podcast. Today I have with me um, an inventor, um, a man from hospitality turned businessman, and that's William McLaren. Hi William, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for the invitation. Your business is called Crable, and I'm an IP lawyer. All the best brands are words that don't have any meaning in relation to what uh, the product that they're applied to. So Crable's a brilliant example of that because you can't tell what it is from the name. But once you know what it is, it does make sense. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so for those that are in the audience who don't know what it is, can you, can you explain what Crable is? Um, well, Crable is a company, but it's also our um, eponymous charging shelf. So what we do is we design and supply charging shelves for commercial premises. And once I come up with the idea of the product, I wanted to name the product or name the company. And what I had to find was a, a name that didn't exist in the Oxford English Dictionary. So that took a lot of searching and coming up with different names that sounded like they should do, but didn't. Um, and eventually I came across Crable because as I was using sketches to uh, adapt the, the design, um, eventually I sort of, through some sort of lens, came up with Crab Table, even though it's a shelf, not a table. Crab Table, Crable. And then I decided then I could do the searches and make sure it wasn't being used. The rest is history. Quite. So in five words, can you tell me what problem does Crable solve? Right. Um, well, as we're all to do with charging, I think it would be probably best to quote our slogan, um, which we would feature in as much material as we could, which is an end to cable chaos, keeping everything compact, organized and in place. So an end to cable chaos would, would sum up what we're trying to do. What it does is it allows people to charge multiple appliances in a very compact, conveniently located unit, as I say, in commercial premises. It's just as effective in a uh, domestic environment, but we specifically designed it for commercial, busy environments where a charging shelf, kiosk, uh, station has to be really robust and be able to stand, withstand heavy traffic. Uh, and that's what it's designed to do, multiple appliances at once, whether that's through wireless charging, USB ports, plug sockets, or for it to provide light through an LED. We can even um, configure them with Bluetooth speakers, all sorts of things um, that can be configured within the body of the shelf. Um, but fundamentally, it's a shelf, but has the convenience of, a, of you know, um, yeah, comp in a compact way, keeping all of your appliances close together and charging in one. And have you always been a frustrated inventor or was that? Absolutely uh... not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, I came up with the idea because I needed the product and the product didn't really exist. There were sort of versions that fulfilled maybe 20% of what I was looking for, um, most of which were very domestic products uh, and just wouldn't have been able to withstand the uses that I, or the environment that I wanted to, to put this product into. You so, were in hospitality at the time. I was in hospitality, yeah. So I was, at the time I was running a hostel chain, um, which some people will, if you use the word hostel, will immediately assume backpacker. Um, to me, it was uh, super budget accommodation. So we had multiple sectors, whether that be backpackers, stag and hens, school groups, um, you name it, we, we appeal to anybody who, who had a super budget. Um, and with the various groups brought quite, you know, quite a lively atmosphere. And so any product that we installed had to 
be able to withstand um, <laughs> the lively atmosphere. That, that lively atmosphere, <laughs> being polite, yeah. Um, and like I say, the products on the market mm. didn't didn't tick all the boxes that I wanted to tick in terms of charging. Whether it be you, you know, it might have a light and it might be a shelf, but it wouldn't have charging and and so on and so forth. And certainly, nothing on the market had wireless charging, which. When we came up with the idea in 17, 2017, you know, wireless charging was just getting started um, and really didn't get going until 19. And even now, it's probably another two years before it tips to being the go-to method of charging. So you were in you were in business, as you say, you spotted that there was a, 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 an unmet need for your mm. particular type of mm. business. How did you get from there to inventing a product and leaving? Um, well, I had a uh, had a very very supportive employer. Uh, I was working for a, um, a Scottish family um, who owned the company that I was running for them, and I told them all about what I was doing and how they'd benefit or the company would benefit if if I took on this project and you know and, and designed something that would be of benefit to to the estate. And um, they were incredibly supportive. And so for what would have been two two and a half to three years i was i was essentially spending 80 percent, 90 percent of my total time not just my sort of work time running running that company and then in the spare time that i, I could I, I started developing cravel um and fine-tuning cravel so that it wouldn't just be a product for a hostel environment or indeed for a hotel environment what i was very keen from the outset was to make sure that it would cross multi-sectors um, so any commercial environment so whether that was for an airport um, other other transport hubs um, and, and anywhere that that had a lot of people. That's what I wanted to design at the time. And then, I, I, so I carried on running the, the hostel chain for them for a number of years, uh, doing the two simultaneously. And then, really, I suppose it, it. Looking back, it was quite fortuitous. If anybody had any good fortune out of COVID in that that allowed COVID and the lockdowns allowed me to to sort of withdraw from from the hostel chain that I was I was running and solely focus on on Crable. Okay so um, you obviously recognize the unmet need within the hostel environment um, and as you said you set out to design a, a product that would have multiple cross-sector uses. Mm -hmm. how, um, how, how have you found launching a new product and convincing customers that they too have a, an unmet need? Um, well, over the years, it's, it's been about defining the value proposition for each and every sector, which is very different. And within each sector, the different people and different roles that they have have very different needs. So it's been about understanding who you're talking to, in what sector, in what organization, and being able to, A, say how that will make their life easier, improve their customer or employee experience, but also give them a return on investment. Um, which ultimately, what you know, in the commercial environment, is what what everybody's looking for. So it's been about defining that because there isn't one size fits all. It might be one product with a million different versions, but the needs in a hospital are very different to the needs at Twickenham or the needs, um, as I say, in an airport. Mm. So you have to be able to um, communicate what that value proposition is to that individual. And as I say, the the different positions within an organization have very different needs and the way that they look at it. So you've got to you've got to know who you're talking to and, and be armed accordingly. So you talk there about hospitals, about sporting venues, um, hospitality. What's the most unusual inquiry or use that uh, people have, have, have come to you with? Um, the, the boring answer to that is that most people come back and try and redesign it. Mm. Um, so they say, does it? Can we have it in a different size? And I said, well, you can't have any different size. It is literally one size fits all, but you can have it in different colors and um, have different branding on it. And whatever. But I suppose the really exciting thing is, is when you're talking to somebody and they're, they're immediately seeing what different uses they can, they can put it and um, put the cradle to. So I'm very much promoting a wall mounted charging shelf. But then I might be talking to a hospital in a in a trust or, or, or somebody within the trust, and they're saying, "Well, can we mount it on a trolley? And can it be on a on a on a bed? And it be, can it become a you know a mobile mm. um, device?" And and I, you know, 
got to be honest and say, well, we can do anything, you know, but the, you know, with electricity, there comes complications and the <laughs> safety issues that you've got to, you've got to do. But it, it's great that when you're talking to somebody, they can sort of picture your product being deployed in all sorts of environments. And that's, that's, that's really good because it's ultimately it helps us mm. and, and expands our, um, our ability to give them that value proposition and say, have you thought about doing this? Or have you thought about doing that or putting it there? And what's the biggest challenge that you face in persuading people that um, this is something that they should have in their business and uh, or their organisation? Um, we sit firmly in what's called the non-data capture camp. So if you put your phone on a cradle charging shelf, um, we don't take all of your contact lists, birthdays, diary and everything else, which a lot of competitors are able to do and then sell on in terms of big data. And until people understand that is a real benefit, and, and in particular when we're talking to hospitals and police forces and, and, and other big organizations, you know, security of personal data is of paramount importance. That, that the fact that we sit in the non-data capture camp, the only time it's a hindrance is that we're not able to deliver statistical information of how often cradles are in use. It's all got to be visual. It's got to be feedback from people who use it. Um, and so I can't, for instance, say, right, that cradle in A&E has been used 80% of the time uh, in the last week, or it, it's predominantly used at certain times of day. It's all got to be much more. Um, I can't give the statistical information on usage, but it's incredibly important, I think, to be in the non-data capture camp because your data is being taken at every opportunity and sold on, as, as, as we all know, but we willingly do it. But I would have thought when you're dealing with the public sector in particular, they would have been, particularly hospitals, mm. that will be comforting to know that you're not doing that because a lot of people do engage with with, mm. with health service because of the access to data, potential mm. access to data. And I think they, 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 you know, I used to work with the NHS quite a bit and it's one of the first things that projects have to go through is information governance, whereas mm. if you can say we're hands off on the data. Yeah. Um, so, uh, have you, do you have an in, intention to create some functionality where you could measure usage, but without collecting data uh, that relates to the people that are using it? Yeah, we can we can mm. do that already, but it's quite a complicated setup, uh, electronic mm. setup, whereby you're basically um, recording pulses when an item is placed and starts pulling electricity right. through a wireless charge or through a USB port. Mm. So there's absolutely no personal data; it's just measuring. But there's quite a complicated setup in the background, mm. which you you can obviously then Bluetooth um, to a you know, to a port nearby, but it's not part of our standard setup. And I think that's where um, you know we're also used to quick, very quickly clicking yes to sign um, to agree to terms and conditions, but we very rarely read them. You probably do, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know when we're signing up for Wi-Fi yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah, it may be, you you've, you've got to check these things, and so. To be to be able to you know proudly and firmly state that we're non-data capture and people to use it with confidence, um, it, you know it's really important for us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think the power the, the power of data now that's where a lot a lot of the time in in you know projects that I'm working on that's where the value is it's the the data side of it but for for, for your business it's actually it's the it's the opposite yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. The, uh, yeah. um, which is which is refreshing to yeah. to hear. Mm. Um, so your target market is obviously commercial. Um, I've got two teenagers, and I'm sure they would love one in their uh, in their bedrooms. Um, is there a potential sort of domestic market in there as well? Is that something that you would think about? Um, well, we're selling on Amazon, um, right? Okay. And, and so there is the potential for people to mm. buy them, to put them in whatever environment they want to put that the cradle yeah. charging shelf. Um, it isn't our core business, mm. so. I, I, I deploy um, a stock of cradles to Amazon to be fulfilled by Amazon on their prime service next day. But that's, you know, that's B2C and, and we're very much focused on the B2B because, you know, being brutally honest, there is an installation aspect. Mm. There's a safety aspect. And so the, the charging shelf's been designed to be wall mounted as a floating shelf direct to mains, which you know, requires an electrician to do that installation, which most people wouldn't. Mm. Uh, and I you know, wouldn't want to encourage people to, to do that installation themselves. But then there's an added cost to that. So you get the economies of scale with installation when you're in, installing multiple cradles in one venue or in, you know, yeah. you know, multiple areas. And that's that 
lends itself more to the B2B sector, uh, B2C side and, and the multiple sectors that we're targeting. And that's why we specifically target big buildings. So whether that's hospitals, sports stadium, um, travel hubs, you know, that, that's, that's where we're very focused as a company. That's what, 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 where we, we see our, um, the best deployment of cradles. But yes, they work domestically. Very happy. Our daughters have obviously got them in the <laughs> Yeah, multiple. <laughs> and what's the, what's the most popular colour? <laughs> theirs. Well, they've had to spray paint theirs, obviously pink. And, oh, and, um, okay. But yeah, we, we do three colours as standard, but we can manufacture in any colour. Mm -hmm. um, but the three are white, dark grey and black. And they're the most popular. Dark grey tends to be more for accommodation, mm. for whatever reason. Um, light grey for more of the... I don't want to say clinical settings, but just um, you know, most most walls are white, so they want they want the cradle to stand out to a degree yeah. with branding, but to, but to fit in with, um, with with that environment. So they tend to be the most popular ones. But then I've had some inquiries over the last week or so from um, big music festivals and um, sporting events that they want the black ones because their logo tends to stand out stand out yeah, more right. on, on black. So. Okay, so the majority that you supply will be branded in some way for for the customer. Yeah, most of mm. most people want them branded, um, whether that's with a logo or a call to action, or we can do QR codes. So a lot of companies are looking at having the QR code linked to their Just Giving page if they're looking to raise funds for their, their charitable arm or, or whatever it may be, or to raise awareness of something else. So. Most people want to use, or most companies want to use that as a communication so that mm. not only um, is the Crable providing them with a service to their customers or the people within their business, but also it's a method of communication yeah. and interactive advertising. You mm. knew there was as much to do to a shelf. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I, I didn't get started. Yeah. And obviously along, along the way, or along your journey from... I would say working with hospitality, developing the product, getting it launched. You must uh, you must look back now with the benefit of hindsight and go, I wish I hadn't done that, or I wish I'd done that differently. What what what's your wish I'd done that differently moment? Um, it would have been a lot, an, aw <laughs> an, an awful lot. But I, you've you've got to be, well, I've, I've got to be realistic. You've got to put put it behind you, but learn from it. Obviously, mm. and I know that sounds a bit. Um, but I, you know, if somebody said, "What's the best investment that you've made?" I would say mistakes, because it's only you know if you perhaps rushed into something, then you know you learn. Um, or it might be you're working with the wrong person who just not necessarily is a wrong fit, but just look, is looking at things from a completely different um, through a different lens that that you that you are. Mm. So I think there's a value to all mistakes that have been made, but I wouldn't necessarily single anyone out. Um, but I have. Being persuaded uh, at times, um, being sold to, perhaps. Um, but I'd put that down to naivety. I'm not an engineer. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm on a. I'm on a journey now that has no plan. I've got. There's nobody. You know, dictated and um, defined the roadmap mm. um, as such. So there's going to be more mistakes along the way. But as long as I learn from them, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we always think you spend so much time devoted to to, to work or your vocation or your job or whatever it is that it's really important to have some fun along the way. How do you how how do you have fun? You must have had some fun with designing and getting things sorted. <laughs> um, fun? Yes, fun. Um, <laughs> or has it all been hard work? <laughs> no, there's been a lot of satisfaction. Yeah. Um, how much fun along the way? I don't know. I, I think. Um, I've just absolutely loved every element of it, even when it's been awful, you know, when COVID struck and the lockdowns first mm. hit, it was horrific. Um, and that when, you know, we're doing trials at big international stadiums and then all the events are closed down and hospitality shut down and, and you think, well, where the hell do I go now? But even at, at those times of uh, adversity, you, you either get a buzz from trying to figure out what the hell you're going to do next, yeah. which for us was pivot and whereby we were equally focused on healthcare and hospitality events. It meant that during COVID and lockdown, it was purely healthcare that we were focused on. Um, so yeah, fun, I suppose, you know, you can look back and, and there'd probably be some highlights, but I, I, satisfaction from, from the challenges, I suppose, that have been thrown our way.
And what about outside of work? Um, if you're if you're getting satisfaction at work but not fun, what do you do outside of outside of work to? Um, big rugby fan. Right. Um, don't get nearly as many games as I would like to. Playing or just oh, to? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not for twenty or 20, 27 years or something like that playing. But um, uh, no, I suppose that's in terms of sporting. I, I've done the golf thing. I've tried relatively hard to do the golf. No, I haven't. I, I've, I've dabbled in golf and, and retired from that because it, <laughs> it was awful. But I would like to take that up again. I did. I, I, I enjoyed the walk and I enjoyed the banter. Mm. I was just awful at the sport. Um, but I suppose, yeah, rugby, but family. Obviously, it's, it's family time. Mm. But um, I think, especially having done two to three years of, of running the hostel chain and, and, and trying to get this established, there was just no room at all. Uh, and since COVID, again, the benefit of that was, I think you're having to refocus and just suddenly gaining a lot of time it allowed you to be more present, or certainly allowed me to be more present and actually appreciate the moment mm. that, that you're in. Um, and not necessarily enjoyable at the time during the lockdowns because of the frustrations, but you were, I, I definitely became more present and that's something I want to continue doing. Mm. And you mentioned your, your children there, what do they think of your business? Embarrassing. <laughs> um, you know, I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to have Crables installed at their school. Um, but no, they, they don't, they're, they're, they're really supportive. As I say, they've, they've willingly let me, uh, they've let me install them in their bedrooms around the house. Um, and yeah, yeah, they're, they're brilliant. That's good. Mm. So what's next for the business? Um, well, I haven't gone anywhere yet, really. I mean, I, it, the achievement, the, obtaining patents and design registrations and, and things are all part of the journey. Making sales are all part of the journey. But we, I, haven't, I don't feel as if we're anywhere near accomplishing the first phase of, of what I want to do with, with, with the company and, and, and with the product. Um, it's tech. So whilst it was, you, know, you might say that it invented something, I haven't really designed something that includes lots of inventions, really. But you, you get the benefit of a pattern because it's designed and it's got configurability mm. in place. But because of the way that we've secured the patent and the way that tech moves, as long you know, we'll just keep growing with technological um, developments. Um, and there's no reason why we can't. Whether that's you know incorporating Wi-Fi, which we now can do, when if that tips to Li-Fi and data being transferred through light, then you know we'd like to embrace that when the technology allows. Um, so there's there's not really. It's always next, but it's always embracing what what's coming down the track and, and seeing how we can accommodate it into the one shelf, because that's what we do. So you haven't got any other um, inventions that are lurking in the... No, 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 never again. This is, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is the one trick pony for me. But as I say, I mean, it's got a million configurations and because you can do different colours and, and brandability and the number of sectors and... We're only talking to people really in the UK and Ireland and a few organisations in the Middle East now, but we've got pretty much global protection. So, you know, phase two is international, I suppose, would be, you know, once we really get momentum in our domestic market mm. is that that's next is, is, is to is to replicate that in, in the bigger markets abroad. And have you looked at sort of external investment in yeah. your business? Yeah, yeah. Um, I. I'm going to I'm going to sound really naive, but the investment is for me is it's really important. You, 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 it's getting the right investment at the right time, um, and there's been opportunities to to take to take investment. But having got this far, I, I just feel that it's got to be more than money. There has to be um, a complementary personality mm. or a complementary vision. A uh, black book of, of of contacts, and you know, and, and and that investment might come from abroad. It might it might be from a particular sector. Um, so I'm not saying there's, there's certainly um, I'm exploring investment all the time, but I'm I'm, I'm really determined to make it. The, you know, it's got to be a good fit. Mm, it sounds like you're looking for an investment partner rather than cash. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> which yeah. is yeah, which has been hard to find anyway. So mm. you know, there's there's lots of advertising for grant funding, mm. and, and it's not easy to get. Um, 
And certainly as a startup organization, when you're not necessarily profitable, it's even harder because you're immediately considered in distress mm -hmm. because you're not making profit. So it's sort of a, um, it's a no-win situation. But the, we have managed to secure some grant funding uh, and that's been, that's been really helpful, uh, but you certainly can't rely on it. Um, so when investment comes, I'd like for it to be big. Not necessarily the amount, but in, in terms of, let's say, equity, it would be a bigger percentage rather than little bits and pieces. Um, I'd, rather, I'd rather retain more control, work with, with good partners that, um, until, a, until a point where we can you know, bring in different, different, a, a different perspective when it's sort of outgrown me. Yeah. Well, I, am, I look forward to seeing what the future brings. Sounds like there's, uh, there's lots on the horizon and there may be a crable winging its way over Amazon to my house. Oh, <laughs> <right. Yeah, no laughs> Didn't realise you sold them on, yeah. on there, so I do now. So thanks ever so much for your time. Um, fascinating business and fascinating story that you've got of the journey that you're still on. Still on. Thanks, thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for listening to Fear Less, Do More. All of our guests come from a diverse range of backgrounds, but they all share a common drive to face their fears, take action, and create meaningful impact. If you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast, please follow us at Square One Law on Instagram and LinkedIn, and share the content with your friends, family, and networks. Thank you, and see you again on our next episode.